All right, how many of you have your Bibles? Have you got your Bibles? Hey, this is a precious gift. This is, I'm, I'm telling you, treasure this. Treasure, treasure the Bible. If you have your Bibles, we're going to turn back to the book of Proverbs. We're going back to the book of Proverbs. If you remember, we started last week with an introduction to Proverbs. And we're going to take our time as we go through this book. This is certainly the, uh, a book that is dealing with wisdom. We have, talked, we have talked about it in wisdom and instruction and discretion and all these words that are used in the first uh, six verses of Proverbs chapter 1 all basically talk about wisdom. But that wisdom, we have condensed it even into something else, and that is basically how to, how to live skillfully. Skillful living is really what we're looking at when we look at the book of Proverbs. And by skillful, I don't just mean um, some type of athletic uh, endeavor or, or anything like that. It's more than that. But, you know, there is, an, there is a way in which we can live skillfully for the Lord to bring glory and honor to him. Or we can live a life of self-indulgence and a life of folly and foolishness. That, that ends in ruin in our life. Not in, and oftentimes that takes place here, but of course the real tragedy is when it takes place in, the, uh, in eternity because there are only two destinations, heaven or hell. But Proverbs looks at skillful living that is useful both for eternity but also for the here and now. How many of you want to live skillful lives? How many of you want to live lives that are blessed unto the Lord and, and fruitful and actually make a difference, not only maybe in, in yourself, but in your family and in those all around us. I think we want to do that. And so we're going to go to Proverbs chapter 1. And as we begin this evening, we're going to look at Proverbs chapter 1, and I'll take you to a couple other uh, scripture portions as well. But again in chapter 1, but this time we're going to pick up in verse 20. Proverbs chapter 1, beginning in verse 20. Wisdom shouts in the street. She lifts her voice in the square. At the head of the noisy streets, she cries out. At the entrance of the gates in the city, she utters her sayings. And this is what wisdom says. How long, O oh naive ones, will you love simplicity? And scoffers delight themselves in scoffing. And fools hate knowledge. Return to my reproof. Behold, I will pour out my spirit on you. I will make my words known to you. Because I called, and you refused. I stretched out my hand, and no one paid attention. And you neglected all my counsel and did not want my reproof. Because of those things, I will even laugh at your calamity. I will mock when your dread comes, when your dread comes like a storm, and your calamity comes on like a whirlwind, when distress and anguish come on you. Then they will call on me, but I will not answer. They will seek me diligently, but they shall not find me, because they hated knowledge, and they did not choose the fear of the Lord. They would not accept my counsel. They spurned all my reproof. So they shall eat of the fruit of their own way and be satisfied with their own devices. For the waywardness of the naive shall kill them, and the complacency of fools shall destroy them. But he who listens to me shall live securely and shall be at ease from the dread of evil. Now, if I, and if I can call your attention again just to verses 20 and 21, wisdom shouts in the street. She lifts her voice in the square. At the head of the noisy streets, she cries out. At the entrance of the gates in the city, she utters her saying. Just keep that in mind. And now let's go to chapter 8. Let's go back to Proverbs chapter 8. Let's go to Proverbs chapter 8 and look at verses 1 through 3. Does not wisdom call... And understanding lift up her voice. On the top of the heights beside the way where the paths meet, she takes her stand. Beside the gates, at the opening of the city, at the entrance of the doors, she cries out. And again, just looking at one more portion of Scripture in chapter 9, and let's look at verse 3. Proverbs 9 and verse 3. Again, this is speaking about wisdom. She has sent out her maidens. She calls from the tops of the heights of the city. So we see here in the book of Proverbs that wisdom is kind of personified as a woman, as a lady. And we see that she calls out. And as we begin, I just want to 
bring to your attention something that I think is painfully obvious. We live in a noisy world, don't we? Really, really, a lot of loud voices. We're invaded by voices, loud voices, competing voices. The world has voices that are competing for your attention. They're competing for, will you believe me? So we've got, you know, an, an entire narrative of what is real news, what is fake news. I've never talked to so many people anymore that are like, I don't know what to believe anymore. We're living in a world that's filled with all kinds of voices, and they're not even saying the same thing. They're saying many, many different things, but they ring out everywhere, loud and clear. In fact, we very seldom, I would ask yourself, when's, when's the last time you had some silence in your life? And I don't mean just for a minute or two, but when's the last time you sat back and you had even 30 minutes of just silence? Just 30 minutes, maybe it's just of reading and reading just to yourself where there's just silence. Oh, yeah, I have six or eight hours when I'm sleeping. Well, that's not what I mean. <laughs> Talking about when you're awake. Think about how noisy the world is. But you know, folks, the greatest tragedy of life isn't that people invade our privacy as much as we, we had that happen. Um, it's not that, that things get on our nerves and that these uh, voices can kind of help to destroy the delicate balance of our lives because I see more and more people that are just kind of like with hair on fire. They're going crazy. They, they, they really, and, and that's, those are bad things. Don't get me wrong. Those are terrible things. But the, the greatest tragedy is that there's so much noise that people can't hear the things that they really need to hear. There's so much noise that it drowns out the voice we need to hear, that drowns out the message all of us really need to hear. See, God is trying to get through to us. God is forever speaking. Remember how the book of Hebrews opens up? And it talks about the fact that in olden days, meaning the Old Testament times, God would speak in different ways and different means, and he would use different people in the prophets. But in these last days, God has spoken through his son. God is forever reaching out and trying to speak to us. That's why I read you these passages in Proverbs to get you to understand that wisdom is calling out. Wisdom is saying to everyone, listen to me. If you want to live skillful lives, listen to me. But we've got to sometimes tune out all of the other noise, amen? Because there's confused, com confused communications that come in, all kinds of static and everything else. And you can't tune into God's message if your mind is full of earthly static. It's an absolute impossibility. There are foolish voices that will attempt to lead us further and further astray from the wisdom that God would give to us in and through his word by and through his Holy Spirit, in the workings and in the ministry of his Son. God wants to speak to us. Are we willing to listen? We have all these modern conveniences, really modern noisemakers. Oftentimes, that's what our, 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 uh, all of our communication devices, they just become noisemakers, just so we can have more and more noise in our lives. But guess what? The same thing happened in ancient Israel in Solomon's day. And this is why the Holy Spirit directed him to write these words. Wisdom is calling out. Will you listen? Will you hear? Tonight, I pray that our, our minds and our hearts would be open to hear what God would say to us by way of wisdom. And let's open up in prayer. Let's ask the Lord to help us as we move forward. Heavenly Father, I ask tonight that you would give us eyes to see and ears to really hear and comprehend what you want to say to us tonight. Lord, we must hear. Wisdom is calling out. You are calling out through your word to us. We can live skillful lives, lives of wisdom and, and knowledge and understanding. Um, Lord, if we would but listen to you, but we must listen. So I pray tonight, give us hearts, every one of us here, from the youngest to the oldest, whether we think we know nothing or we think we know it all or somewhere in between, Lord, tonight, let us have hearts that are open to hear from you, that we would understand that you were looking to speak to your people in Solomon's day when these Proverbs were written, and you're looking to speak to your people today. And all we have to do is listen. Let this be, I pray, in Jesus' name. And everyone said, amen. 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 So what you'll notice, and you can turn back over to Proverbs chapter 1, and this is where we'll camp out um, 
in this session, is that what you'll, what you'll come to see is that wisdom, again, is personified um, by this lady. She, it's a she. It's, it's feminine in the Hebrew. So wisdom is personified as a woman that is calling out. But there's also another woman in Proverbs. There's two women. There's one woman called wisdom, and there's another woman that's called foolish folly. You could call her by many names, but they are two opposite voices, and they're personified as women that are calling to each and every one of us, hey, follow me. I got some advice for you. I want to tell you how to think. I want to tell you how to act. I want to tell you to make these choices. And we're going to see these two women in these early chapters of Proverbs, and we'll spend quite a bit of time on the different messages that they give to us. And then we'll get into some specifics as well of some of the messages that they share, which are very much opposite one another. And we'll be able to see, who am I listening to? Which direction is my life headed in? But tonight I want us to focus on what wisdom says to us in chapter 1. And there's four things in particular that I want to call your attention to. And the first one is actually in the the later section of chapter 1. And that is that wisdom just calls us to listen. Wisdom calls us to listen. And again, we're reminded in verse 20, wisdom shouts in the streets. She lifts her voice in the square. At the head of the noisy streets, she cries out. At the entrance of the gates in the city, she utters her saying. So wisdom is right there in a prominent place, not hidden, not somewhere far away, but in a prominent place. And wisdom is lifting her voice and calling out to everyone, listen to me. Listen to what I have to say. And of course, we could look to the other scriptures that we referenced as well, and we would see that this is how it's working. Wisdom is calling out, and I want you to note a couple of things. First of all, the call goes out in the streets. What does that mean, Pastor? That means that it's an open call. We have a so-called church down the street. It's not a church. It's a cult. It's a Jehovah's Witness hall, all right? It's, it, and, and it's where they meet. And one thing that you notice with all of their meeting places, their halls, is that they don't have windows. You know why they don't have windows? If there's an, actually, there's a reason for that. They're making a statement, and the statement is you can't look in, and we really don't look out either, but the big thing is it's secret. You have to come inside these doors for this secret information. Whereas most church buildings have some form of windows, because we're making a statement that, yes, you can come in here and, here and we can receive the word of God and grow and encourage one another as believers. But we also are pressing out to a lost and a dying world. Amen. See, God's not willing, what, that any perish, but that all come to repentance. God is calling out and wisdom calls out in the streets, meaning it's an open invitation. And, and, and so we're commanded, listen, it's not optional, but we are commanded as believers to do what? To hold the message inside to ourselves? No, to get the message out. We're called as believers to do just as wisdom does and to call out into the streets. Get up on the rooftops. Shout it out. For us, the message is very simple. Jesus saves. He has come to save us. He's coming again one day. Give your heart to him. Come into his kingdom. That's the message that we cry out on the streets today. Here, wisdom is crying out, and it's an open invitation to everyone. Everyone that's listening, in fact, you'll see here in this first chapter that wisdom is even calling out to the foolish, even the naive, even the simple ones. Wisdom doesn't, wisdom doesn't uh, say, well, I'm only going to speak to this certain group of people that were born in this certain location or had this certain um, moniker or part of who they are. Wisdom is non-discriminatory in that she is willing to call out to everyone. Aren't you glad of that? Yeah. This is very much like the gospel invitation that we have. Aren't you glad that God has brought the Gentiles in that whosoever will can believe? It's kind of that same principle here that wisdom is calling out. The key is who's listening. Who's listening? Really, really important that we get this. Proverbs 4.1 says, Hear the instruction of the Father. Again, in Proverbs 5.1, Give attention to my wisdom. Incline your ear to my understanding. This is spoken to sons, but it would be, it would be like a father giving advice to his children. Listen to me. Heed what I say. Proverbs 6.20, My son, observe the commandment of your father, and do not forsake the teaching of your mother. And, of course, Hebrews chapter 3, verses 7 and 8, the Holy Spirit actually speaks out and says, Today, if you will hear my voice, 
Do you notice that? If you will hear my voice, don't harden your heart. We need to hear God's voice. The Holy Spirit is speaking out. Wisdom is crying out. Will anyone listen? Will anyone hear? I don't know if you remember, but Jesus spoke of this as well in Matthew chapter 13. He spoke to the people in parables. And remember, the question was asked, why are you speaking in parables? And Jesus said this, Though seeing, they do not see, and though hearing, they do not hear or understand. In them, the prophecy of Isaiah is fulfilled. You will be ever hearing, but never understanding. You will be ever seeing, but never perceiving. And so although wisdom calls out, we have to listen and hear, and then, of course, make application, because it's one thing, because we have an old saying, don't we? It went in one ear, and what? Went out the other. So when it comes to wisdom, it's not good enough just to hear, but it, we have to retain it. We have to retain what we hear and act upon what we hear. I would also have you note that uh, if wisdom is rejected, and if the other woman, foolish or folly, is embraced, if her lifestyle and her um, suggestions are embraced, then it can lead to such hard times that recovery can be next to impossible. And we see this here as we move through um, in verse 24 of chapter 1. Because I called and you refused. I stretched out my hand and no one paid attention. You neglected my counsel. You didn't want my reproof. What does it say in verse 26? I'll laugh at your calamity. I'll mock when your dread comes. When your dread comes like a storm, your calamity comes on like a whirlwind. When, you're, when distress and anguish come on you, then you'll call on me and I'm not going to answer. You'll seek me diligently but you won't find me. Why? You hated knowledge and you didn't choose the fear of the Lord. Now, this is not dealing with salvation per se because God is always listen, is willing to listen to, the, to even the most rank sinner that has rejected again and again. If someone whosoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. But when it comes to wisdom, what Solomon is saying here, what the Holy Spirit is saying is if you reject wisdom's advice and you go off and do your own thing and listen to folly, and to foolish. Sometimes you get the fruit of those consequences, and, and sometimes the consequences don't automatically go away, and some people dig themselves such a deep hole that they say, oh no, I want to listen now, I want to listen now. And it's basically wisdom is saying it's too late. You've already dug your hole, you're now stuck in the circumstance of life. I mean, how many people want to go out and sow bad seed, but then reap something good in return? And when they begin to re reap a bad crop, what does everyone say? Oh, no, no, I don't want this. Oh, no, 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 T time out. I don't want this crop. Well, but you spent your whole life sowing this crop, and now all of a sudden. And so is God merciful? Yeah. Every so often, God may give you a crop failure. But, but the majority of the time, the principle is true in Galatians, that what we sow, we reap. And so in this life, if you so all, t you know, if you go out and, and you're having sex with all different types of people and you're putting yourselves in dangerous situations and, and drugs and needles and all these things, then you can't go out and cry and say, oh, wow, I can't believe I got a disease. I can't believe I got pregnant. Well, duh, what do you think is going to happen, right? Oh, oh, Lord, would you please? I know I'm nine months pregnant. Make this baby disappear. Probably not going to happen. This is why the world, by the way, steps in and tries to make it happen which is a whole nother problem, isn't it? A serious sin. But God is not most of the time going to come in. And wisdom is saying here, listen, there's a time to hear me. And if you don't hear and you embrace folly over and over again, there's a time when you may call out for the goodness of wisdom, but you've stepped over the line and now you're going to have to deal with the consequences. Not with eternal consequences necessarily, but consequences in this life. That's the way it goes, doesn't it? Even if you're a Christian... Well, I'm a Christian, so I can go out and rob a bank and God will... I just ask God to forgive me and I won't pay the consequences. No, you, you're still going to go to jail. <laughs> you're gonna, that's going to happen. Because you didn't listen to wisdom, you listened to folly instead. So does everybody understand? That's the point here. It's really important. The consequences of bad choice after bad choice will often come into our lives. And sometimes we have to live with those consequences. The consequences of foolish decisions. Disease, broken marriages, financial ruin, a lot of things we do. We end up living with some of those things. God gives us heaven if we call out to him, but he doesn't automatically just restore everything in this life 
to as if it was like none of that ever happened. We still deal with those things. Everybody get that? And that's wisdom. That's how wisdom works. Listen when you're young. That's why I say to the young people that are here, right? Listen, listen, and do what the scriptures tell you to do. Live out your life in wisdom, not in folly, and you'll reap a good harvest. Amen? And, of course, wisdom reminds us of the certainty and the finality of the judgment of those who walk in foolishness in verses 28 through 31, if we look at those. They will call on me. I will not answer. They'll seek me diligently. They won't find me because they hated knowledge. They did not choose the fear of the Lord. They would not accept my counsel. They spurned all, all my reproof. Look at verse 31. So they shall eat of the fruit of their own way and be satiated with their own devices. And so they're going to be filled. Satiated means filled. They're going to be filled up with all the stuff that they wanted. So listen to me. Wisdom calls out to all of us to listen to her. Listen to what wisdom is saying. And then number two, wisdom calls us to recognize the voices of temptation. We must recognize the voices of temptation. And we're going to go back now to verses 10 through 14 of chapter one, beginning in verse 10. My son, if sinners entice you, do not consent. If they say, come with us, let us lie and wait for blood. Let us ambush the innocent without cause. Let us swallow them alive like Sheol, even whole as those who go down to the pit. We'll find some kind of precious wealth. We'll fill our houses with spoil. Throw in your lot with us, and we shall, have, and we shall all have one purse. If that happens, then verse 15 is what? Don't walk with them. So wisdom calls us to recognize the voices of temptation, the voices in the world of those that do not follow God or love God send out messages that are enticing, especially as we are younger, but sometimes not younger, sometimes older. Listen to me. I've seen people that were 80 years old and older, and that's just not to, to anyone here, <laughs> but this has to go out. We've got, everybody needs to hear this. Listen, I, I've, I've dealt with people, and I hope I can be frank and blunt with you. I've dealt with people that I'm like, man, they got hormones like a teenager. And they're 80 years old. They're not, I mean, I've, I've dealt with people that it's like they're dealing with sin that you would think, well, that's something teenagers deal with. And they're much older than teenagers, and they're still dealing with them. So wisdom goes out to everyone. And wisdom calls out. And we have to, and one of the things wisdom says to us is be careful and distinguish the voices of temptation and know how to deal with those. So we've got to recognize the voices of temptation here in the world. And you notice in those verses, in verses 10 through 14, there's a lot of they say or let us, let us do this, let us do that. You see that again and again in those verses. And so what do they promise? What does the world promise? Real quick. There are three things in these four verses here, uh, or verses 10 through 14, I should say, that the world kind of promises. In verse 11, they promise excitement. Do you see this? Look what it, if they say, come with us, let us lie in wait for blood. Let us ambush the innocent without cause. Let's swallow them alive like Sheol, meaning the grave. Even whole as those who go down to the pit. So that's, oh, wow, that's exciting. Wow. Yeah, let's get in on this. The world promises this type of excitement, but of course it's an excitement that's engaged in, in, in the hurting of others, isn't it? In, the, in, in, in breaking down and tearing apart those that are innocent, but there's an excitement there. Does the world not do the same thing today? This is, listen to me, this is folly. This is not wisdom speaking. This is folly. Sinners telling you, hey, here's where the excitement is. Come on over here. How many times have I heard stories of people that were killed because they were in the wrong place at the wrong time? Now, you may be going out just to McDonald's or something, and something bad happens to you there. That's just, you know, it happens. But I'm going to tell you something. If you're in the middle of the bar at 2 a.m. in the morning, and a fight breaks out, and you get your head busted open, don't be crying out that, oh, I'm just an innocent person. No, you were in the wrong place at the wrong time. You were asking. We have another saying, right? They were asking for what? Trouble. Trouble. But you guys are not, is everybody, does everybody go out to the bars at 2 a.m.? <laughs> How am I not getting a lot of amens here? We may need to, we may have a massive altar call, Brother Iver, at the end of this thing here. 
Listen, there are, there are places that we go and there's this thing of excitement of, oh, come here. But, but the cruelty of it comes back to, to haunt us. And so the let us and the they say the, the promise is one of excitement. There's another promise, a promise in verse 13 that catches a lot of people by surprise. We shall find all kinds of what? Precious wealth or valuable wealth. We shall fill our houses with spoil. So there's a promise of easy money. Hey, come with us and you can get easy money, man. This is yours for the taking. I've known people that would engage in under-the-table exchanges. You know, well, I, oh, I've got this supply of equipment here. Where did it come from? Oh, well, you know, it's just, you know, somebody just dropped it off to me. Just a warehouse. Don't, don't ask any questions. I'd let you have it for half off. You don't have to go to Sears or to anywhere else. I give it to you for half off. If you know better as a believer and you know this is stolen merchandise, do you have any business accepting that? No. no. Oh, it's easy money. Oh, this is easy. That's what, the, that's, that's what the world says. Much less, let's go out and let's do this and defraud people. Well, that doesn't happen in church. Are you kidding? Sadly, I can't tell you the number of ministers and the number of churches that have gone down for this very thing of trying to... Tell people, hey, invest your money here. We're going to do a retirement center. And here it all is. Invest all your money. And, and these folks invest everything. And it's just, it's obviously, it's a scam. It's not real. And people lose. And th there are ministers and ministries and churches that have gone under for that very thing. The enticement of easy money we have to be careful of. And then real quickly, there's another enticement. And that's in verse 14. And this is, I think, particularly interesting today. Throw in your lot with us. We shall all have one purse. So there's an enticement of the camaraderie of the gang. There's, the, the, there's that enticement of, hey, let's all come. We're all together. We're in this thing together. Let's all get the same tattoo to show we're all in the same gang. Let's all wear the same style of clothes. You don't think this is real? This is real, folks. There are entire groups of people that, well, if you wear this color and I see you on the street, I know you're a part of this gang. Bang. I'm killing you. Well, you're wearing the other color. Bang. I'm going to kill you. I mean, this stuff happens. There's the camaraderie of the gang that's an enticement. As believers, listen to me. We have our relationship in Jesus Christ. We don't have to go out and, and go with gangs and find our identity in, in big groups and clusters of people that, oh, I'm fighting on this side. I'm fighting on this side. We see this today. We have this mentality today. It's terrible. This is the enticement of sinners. This is the enticement of those that would listen to folly and not to wisdom. Amen? Amen. So we have to be careful and recognize the voice of the temptations from folly, from foolish, from foolishness. Number three, wisdom calls us to know how to reject that temptation. In verse 15, my son, do not walk in the way with them. Keep your feet from their path, for their feet run to evil, and they hasten to shed blood. Indeed, it's useless to spread the net in the eyes of any bird, but they lie in wait for their own blood. They ambush their own lives. So are the ways of everyone who gains by violence. It takes away the life of its possessors. So first of all, in verse 15, I'm going to move through this quickly. He says, check carefully the path that you're on and don't walk with the wrong crowd. Simple message. Don't walk with the wrong crowd. And this is echoed in the New Testament. In 2 Corinthians chapter 6, beginning in verse 14, do not be bound together with unbelievers. For what partnership have righteousness and lawlessness? Or what fellowship has light with darkness? Or what harmony has Christ with Belial? Or what has a believer in common with an unbeliever? Or what agreement has the temple of God with idols? For we are the temple of the living God. Just as God said, listen now, I will dwell in them and walk among them. I will be their God and they shall be my people. Therefore, come out from their midst and be separate, says the Lord. Do not touch what is unclean and I will welcome you. And I'll be a father to you, and you shall be sons and daughters to me, says the Lord Almighty. There are an awful lot of people that reject wisdom's call to separation. Wisdom says there in verse 15, do not walk in the way with them. Keep your feet far from them. I have met the church over the last 30 years. I'm not sure any doctrine has been attacked more than the doctrine of separation. 
We, we've come into this whole new thing here now where in order to win the world, we have to be just like the world. And we have lost the doctrine of separation, even though it's an Old and New Testament doctrine, a very clear doctrine. Don't walk in the way with them. And every time this is presented, and I've had it down through the years in our church as well, I've had people that the minute you begin to talk to them about the need at times to separate from relationships that they have with people that are not walking with the Lord, there's, a, there's pushback a lot of times. Oh, no, no, no. I'm, I'm just there to witness to them. Oh, please. Come on. How often are we going to run with that? And does it work? When you, throw the good, when you throw one good apple into a barrel full of bad apples, how often does the good apple influence all the bad apples and turn all the bad ones good? Just tell me how many times that happened. <laughs> I've never known it to happen. What does happen? What happens to the good apple? It ends up getting rotten. Folks, the wisdom calls out and says, don't walk with them. Don't walk in their ways. And we have to carefully check the path that we're on and not walk with the wrong crowd. Because if you're walking with the wrong crowd, you're going to end up doing the wrong thing. It's pretty simple. It's not. This is not rocket science here but it's stuff we need to listen to and to heed. Then second in verse 17, we're not to dance with temptation because temptation always leads to a trap. And it's interesting because he says, birds don't take the bait when they can plainly see the trap, right? We ought to be smarter than birds. Even the bird, if you're, if you're out there and here the birds are in the trees and you're laying the trap, the birds are smart enough to say, hey, there's a problem here. I'm not taking that bait. But as human beings now, Satan can come out and be blatant and just lay the trap right in front of some people and they just, oh, they just go walking right in. What's wrong with us? And instead, what we're actually told in verses 18 and 19 is that when we disobey God, especially when we harm others in doing so, you end up only harming yourself. You think you're gaining something, but in the end you lose because you sacrifice both the long term and in the short term. You sacrifice everything. There are Christians that are sacrificing their integrity every single day. And there's no need for it. Why should, why should we sacrifice our integrity? For what purpose? What's, what's worth your witness? Can I ask you that? Is there anything as a Christian that is worth your... If something's going to damage your witness, if you have an opportunity to bring one person into the kingdom... What is worth, oh, well, you know, I, I may lose them, but oh, well, I'm going to do this thing. I'm going to engage in whatever this is. It's not worth it. You end up not only do they lose out, you lose out in the long run. And so we're told that we've got to be careful and know how to reject wisdom. And the simple way to reject it is we have to say no to it. Titus tells us that the grace of God teaches us to say yes to ungodliness. Is that what the grace of God teaches us to do? To say yes? teaches us to say no to ungodly. The grace of God working in us, the power of God, we say no to those things. Amen? Amen? And so we've got to understand that. And then the fourth thing, the last thing real quick, is that wisdom calls us to remember final destinies. Wisdom calls us to remember final destinies, and we read that in verses 32 and 33. And we see two destinies here. Verse 32 for the wayward of the naive or for the waywardness of the naive shall kill them and the complacency of fools shall destroy them but he who listens to me to wisdom shall live securely and shall be at ease from the dread of evil <laughs> from the fear of it, from from all these things that can bring fear and dread into our lives so in verse 32, we're told that there's a way, the way of, of listening to folly, and there's a destiny there. Listen, you, you cannot play with fire and not get burned. You're going to get burned. Jeremiah 2.19 says this, Your own wickedness will correct you, and your apostasies will reprove you. Know, therefore, and see that it is evil and bitter for you to forsake the Lord your God. And the dread of me is not in you, declares the Lord of hosts. God says, think about it. Think about your destiny. I've used this example before. Folk, listen to me. If I were up here and I had a bottle and, and you knew the contents, this is not a joke. If I had a bottle that had acid or something that's going to just literally eat your insides away and it's real and you know it's real and I pour it in 
to the container and say, here, come and drink. All of you are going to say no. And if I start walking up to you doing this, you're probably, if you're smart, you're going to back away. You're going to start running. If we were like some of these so-called faith churches in the hills of Kentucky and Tennessee, and I brought out some snakes rattling, threw them out, I would imagine that I would, we would have a Pentecostal, you talk about a Jericho march. We'd probably have a pretty serious Jericho march right out the door quick if you knew these are rattlesnakes, right? Why do we, in the immediate, we can see the danger in the immediate and avoid it. But the bigger danger is the eternal destiny that we somehow put off and think nothing of, and yet God says, listen, in the end, folly will come back and bite you and destroy you. It will, it, it, it will change everything about you, and your end will not be pleasant if you listen to folly. How many people? Oh, just one toke of weed. It's not going to hurt me. And yet how many times have we had loving hands and other ministries that would come up and tell you that gateway drug, number one, above all else, is that. Right? So it starts off so innocent. Just a young person. Oh, just one thing. No one starts off saying, I'm going to be an alcoholic and destroy my life. Never starts off that way. But that's what ends up happening when we just make that first choice. Then another choice. Then another. Then another. That's why the Bible makes this call and says, listen to me. Rem Wisdom says, remember the eternal destiny that's coming as you make choice after choice after choice. And then we finish with verse 33 on this, on this high note at the end of the chapter. But he who listens to me shall live securely and shall be at ease from the dread of evil. And the expression here that's used suggests a permanent, settled condition that is free from the sense of danger and dread. There is nothing like being able to lay your head down on your pillow at night and not have to worry, wow, is the big secret going to be revealed tomorrow? Are they coming for me tomorrow? I've been dodging the IRS for 20 years. Are they going to come busting in? I, I robbed that bank two years ago. Are they going to catch up with me? Are they, you know, seriously. Yeah. Imagine living your life that way. That's a horrible way to have to live, isn't it? Yeah. When you listen to wisdom, you don't live that life. Right. You're able to live a life that brings a peace and a freedom and a lack of that kind of dread when you do that. Amen. That's the kind of life that wisdom calls us to live, a skillful life. Brother Ivor, I'm going to ask you, Brother Ivor, if you would come up. You know, Jesus said, my peace I give to you. I leave it with you. I give it to you. It's a settled mind and heart that's in right standing with God. A clean conscience that knows it's forgiven. There's nothing like that to walk in wisdom and to be free from the dread of evil. Oh, wow, folks. No fear. What a contrast. What an incredible contrast. How many here can say it is better to walk in wisdom? Better to choose those good friends. Better, to have, better in the house of the Lord. See, I would not give up the house of the Lord and the people of God for, the, for stadiums filled with the lost and with sinners. That I, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't give that up for anything in the world. I, if I only have one or two dear friends that are walking in wisdom, that I can walk along with them the right path, I would so prefer that over thousands or tens of thousands or millions marching and marching towards hell. That means nothing to me. It should mean nothing to you either. What a wonderful thing it is. What a contrast between the false security of the wicked and the true and lasting peace of those that listen to wisdom and follow her ways. Oh, thank you, Lord. Jesus is our assurance. He is our peace. He is our wisdom. Jesus Christ is the one that comes and rescues us and delivers us. And the Apostle Paul even goes on to say that Jesus Christ, he is indeed wisdom to us. Amen? His ways Hit the, 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 what he points us to, who he is, what he has done for us. 
That's where true wisdom lies. I don't know about you, but it, it's, for me, it's an easy call. I, I'm following the way of the Nazarene. I'm following the way of Jesus Christ. I'm walking with Jesus. He's the way, the truth, and the life. That's it. No one gets to the Father except through him. I'm following Jesus. How about you? Let's, ded our, let's dedicate ourselves to fresh and new tonight to walk and to live in wisdom. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I ask tonight that you would speak to us afresh and anew. As we have looked at this first chapter, we see that there, Lord, that wisdom is calling out to every one of us. No one here can say, that's not for me, because wisdom calls out in the streets, calls out loudly for anyone that would listen. Lord, not only that, but wisdom teaches us to recognize the voices of temptation, to recognize when the world is trying to lure us in with a promise of excitement and easy money and the camaraderie of being in the gang, that mentality. That's the enticement of the world, not of wisdom. Wisdom, Lord, we know, calls us to, to understand that how we can reject, reject temptation. And we reject that temptation, Lord, by, by taking inventory of who we walk with. If we walk in with the wrong crowd, we're going to do the wrong things. Wisdom teaches us this clearly. Not only are we going to do the wrong things, but we're going to end up reaping things that we've sown that we don't want to reap. Wisdom teaches us this, Lord. And then finally, Lord, we thank you because wisdom calls us to remembrance that there are only two destinies. The scriptures are very clear. There is no purgatory. There is no other option. It is either, either heaven or hell. And I pray this evening that every one of us here have listened, have listened to you, O oh Lord. And you have said there's no other name given among men, among men whereby we must be saved. It's only the name of Jesus. I pray all of us here have listened to you and that Jesus Christ is Lord and Savior, that we have willingly bowed the knee and that we are on our way to heaven. Because if not, then hell is the only other destination. Remind us of the stark contrast between following the way of folly and following the way of wisdom. Between listening to folly and listening to wisdom. Between acting on folly or acting on wisdom. Lord, let us listen, hear, and walk in the ways of wisdom. I pray everyone here would be able to lead a skillful life a skillful life that brings glory and honor and praise to you. Heavenly Father, as we close this up, I'm reminded afresh and anew that we live in a world that is filled with so much fear, so much anger, so much uncertainty, and that we as your people, we have the message. And just as wisdom calls out, we are to call out the message of Jesus Christ to everyone not just to a select few, but we're to be non-discriminant in the message that we give out to everyone, that it's not just to go to, well, I like this person, so I'll give it to them, but I don't like that person. I'm not going to share it with them. No, Lord, we're called to share with everyone, to let everyone know that Jesus is the way and the truth and the life. And I pray you would do this work by your spirit. And if there's anyone here, if there's anyone here, Lord, that's living in dread, of evil, let them be reminded that there is a fountain filled with blood drawn from Emmanuel's veins and that sinners plunged beneath that flood will lose all their guilty stains, that we can be cleansed. We can be cleansed tonight through the blood of Jesus. If we confess our sins, you're faithful and just to forgive us of our sins. And then we don't have to live in dread anymore. We can live in peace with you. That's what matters, our heart, our conscience, that we know that we're forgiven, that we know that we're cleansed that we can walk in peace. We can walk in assurance with you. And I pray you would do that for each and every one of your people tonight as we give ourselves afresh and anew to you. In the mighty name of Jesus, we ask all these things. Amen and amen.